Welcome to LeapCast. I'm your host, Dr. George James. LEAP stands for leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And I'm on a journey to connect with high achievers and highlight their unexamined human moments. Tune in to learn how these high achieving LEAP individuals were able to reach their greatest potential, face their most difficult challenges, and embrace the human moments that helped them along the way. If you want to get the episode highlights directly in your email, then head to theleapcast.com right now to subscribe. Hi, everybody. Welcome once again to LeapCast, where we talk to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. I, I'm i always excited for every guest because I love all my guests, but I really love today's guest, uh, Elizabeth Earnshaw, known as Liz Earnshaw uh, on Instagram and everywhere else. Uh, listen, Liz. Uh, I think I got that right. Uh, <laughs> I'm just excited. Liz because listens. Liz listens. I, <laughs> thought I, I knew it. I thought I was getting it backwards. Uh, Liz <laughs> listens. That just makes more sense. Um, yeah, it like flows. <laughs> I am excited because uh, Liz is a colleague. Um, she's in the the field and the work that I do, and she's expanded the work in so many ways. So all that to say, welcome, Liz, to LeapCast. Thanks for coming on and being here with me. Thank you for having me. So today, like it, this part of the conversation, it's really just being able to get to know you. And it's really cool. You're my first therapist that I get to really have a conversation with. Uh, and so <laughs> we'll see what happens when we're actually able to release this episode. But I, I'm actually fascinated to talk to you about your journey and we call it your leap story. So if you could just say a little bit about your journey of like how you got into doing where, what you've been doing to even get to the place where you are. But if you can start us off with maybe the early parts, how did you start off your journey? My journey is very messy. It is not linear at all. So I'll Good. try That's to be like. <laughs> I, I bet like most of the people you interview, it's like, yeah, I don't know how I got here necessarily. Yep. There's a pivot or a story or a journey somewhere, which is why we love this because that's just life. That so tell life. us about your, your leaf story. So I, when I went to school, when I went to college initially, I thought that I was going to do something in international relations which is a very random place compared to where I am now. And so I went to college to do that. I went to a really, really small Catholic liberal arts school. And I very quickly realized that if I wanted to do international relations, that probably wasn't the place to go because there was like no diversity and no understanding of this like big picture goal that I had. I remember saying to someone there, like, I really want to do something with like international education, something around that. And they were like, there's not jobs for that. Mm. Looking back, you could make your own job with yeah. that somehow. Like I could have stuck with that. Um, so I somebody trying to crush a dream. Always <laughs> somebody you can't do something. Yeah. It's like, it's so interesting how people do that. And it was very, um, like very decisive the way the person said that, like, wow. oh, absolutely not. There's nothing in that. And it's wow. just not true. You know, I could have created my own business around doing something with consulting, who knows? But I, mm -hmm. I left the school because it just wasn't for me. And I remember I came home and my sister was still a teenager and we laugh about this. And she said, you're just going to be the biggest loser. And mom and dad are so embarrassed that you quit college. She just laid it on thick. <laughs> she just laid it on thick. I'm sure we were fighting about something else. And that that came out. I remember her. She was at the end of the hallway screaming at me. And I like slammed my door. And when I slammed my door, I stubbed my toe into it. It was like this whole of <laughs> Oh, that's usually how I, like you try to make this dramatic exit and then you like hurt yourself. <laughs> totally. And I was like, maybe I am a loser. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> So I'm at home. I left this college. I didn't think it was going to do what I wanted it to do for me. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So, I mean, I was really lucky, even though apparently my parents were embarrassed of me, they did support me and say, you know, whatever you need to do, you can do it. And I took, um, I took a semester and I did like study abroad somewhere. I found a random program online and I found like funds to do it. And I left by myself and I went and did study abroad and then where did, came you, back. Where did you go to study uh that time I did Spain 
So I went and did study abroad. I met one of my best friends in the airport because I was like, you also look like you have no idea where we are right now. Would you like to take a cab together? (laughs) We look like we are totally lost. (laughs) Totally lost, literally, and also figuratively lost in life. (laughs) So I came back. I went to a community college um, in Baltimore, and I loved it. I loved it so much more than the small, expensive liberal arts school I went to. I was learning. I was excited to learn. I felt like I was meeting interesting people. And if anybody's listening and you're wondering where you should go to school, honestly, community colleges are amazing because all of the professors are from the really expensive school down the street. (laughs) And they're also teaching at the community college. And I love that you took the time to even highlight that because, you know, I think that's been one of those shifts that we've seen where Mm -hmm. people have recognized that you can get a really great education at a community college. And then if you decide to transfer on, but really one, save money, get great education and maybe find yourself if you're lost or figure out or start your path along the way. So I think that's great. I loved it. And I I met people I wouldn't have otherwise met because the community college is like a hub for everyone. You know, there's people older than you, younger than you. And it's, it was a really cool experience, which I'm happy that I had. And then I got really deep into being like, I'm just going to do exactly what I want. And I'm going to only take classes I want. And this college doesn't have the classes I want. So I'm going to go to the other community college in a different county. (laughs) Oh, okay. So I switched community colleges and I went to a different community college and I took like negotiation classes and criminal justice classes and international relations classes and sign language. And it was super interesting. All my interests, I'm going to find them and take a class. I'm going to find them and I'm not going to take this path that I'm told I have to take. And it was, I mean, it wasn't always fun because my parents didn't want to support this like zigzagging I was doing. And so I was waitressing and I was like working really late hours and living in a not great apartment and all sorts of stuff, but I didn't care. I kind of wanted to learn what I wanted to learn. And so I did that. I went and I worked in Brazil for a little bit, teaching English, came back and I was like, okay, you do have to figure out (laughs) what you're going to do. And I decided that I wanted to do, be a teacher. And so I went to temple to be a teacher. And during that process, I discovered I wasn't a great teacher. Like when I was doing student teaching, I was really into connecting and I think to be a great classroom teacher, you have to be able to keep your focus on the whole room. And I couldn't do that. I wanted to focus on like this kid over here, like come sit next to me, show me your picture. And then like, you know, somebody's throwing a desk at another person in the corner. (laughs) And so I, I, I pivoted again and I said, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be a teacher. That's not going to be a great thing for me. And so I ultimately finished with a degree in organizational development, which went back to my initial dream where I wanted to help educational institutions, especially elementary level, figure out how to run themselves well and not internationally necessarily at that point, but I wanted to consult. I graduated like it was there all along, right? It was within it was you there. And you were searching and you're finding you got you picked up different pieces along the way and kind of came back to piece of the core. And like as you were talking about you know, teachers, I just want to give a shout out to all the teachers there uh, who, who are listening or might listen, because I think to your point, right, like all the different aspects of being a teacher, we don't even think about. I think we, oh we recognize some of that during the pandemic, but also the thought of like p- focusing on one child enough while also paying attention to everything and everyone else is a skill. <laughs> It is a skill. It is way too overstimulating for me. And I'm so impressed that teachers have the ability to zoom in and zoom out like back and forth. They can yeah. zoom into a kid and zoom back out and zoom back in. And it's a lot. So I have such serious appreciation for teachers. Um, but yeah, so I, I got this degree, which essentially is, you know, helping businesses, organizations develop. Wow. However, I left and I'm thinking, who's going to listen to me? I've never been in an organization. I don't know what I'm 
talking about. And so I still felt really lost. I thought about a million things I could do. And I was driving down the highway and I saw Jefferson's billboard. And I thought that actually sounds really interesting. (laughs) It was like, it came out of the sky. (laughs) It came out of the sky. It was literally a sign (laughs) for my future. There it is. And I went home and I applied to the program and it, it advertised it as a couples and family program. So there was still like this desire to work with kids within that. And I got in and systems, right? Like, you know, this, systems, right? Yeah. That's awesome. hundred. Yeah. So it was a weird connection, but it connected somehow to something. And I went home and I applied and I only applied to that program. I got in. I loved it. Um, and I did the family path because I wanted to work with kids. And so I leave that program and I went to new Orleans and I worked in a school after hurricane Katrina to help them redevelop programming. So after hurricane Katrina, I mean, not only were buildings wiped out, but systems were actually wiped out. So there was nothing, there was no, you know, what's our curriculum? Our books are all underwater. We don't have anything to go off. And a lot of people obviously had to leave. So a lot of teachers left to Houston and all sorts of places. So there just wasn't, um, there wasn't a system created at the time. So I went and I worked with Helene to help them create. Before you you go there, I want to backtrack real quickly. I realized just to highlight, uh, that's one of our connection points was Jefferson, which was Thomas Jefferson, where yeah. I am a professor. And then also uh, Liz went through that program. So that's one. And then two, as you're highlighting just the devastation of what happened in New Orleans and in that area, one, there were some places of lack of infrastructure. And then two, with Katrina, it took out even what what little might have been there for some systems. And and it needed help uh, from folks and resources to be rebuilt. So it sounds like you are a part of that, which is just amazing that, I mean, did you go there with that intention or what was your process that got you through there? Yeah. So when I graduated from Jefferson, which is our connection point, um, my friend set emailed me and she was in new Orleans and she said, I'm working at a school And, um, we have nothing, we have no counselors and we're super overwhelmed. And there were some pretty extreme mental health concerns going on with kids as like young as four or five years old. And she was like, we truly are at a loss of how to help our kids. Would you come to new Orleans and do counseling? And I was like, Yeah, I would actually. And so I left the day after I graduated, I drove down to New Orleans. You were like right away. Now, this wasn't the friend you met in Spain, was it? Mm -mm. No, this was a friend that I met at Temple. She and I developed a literacy program in in Philly called Treehouse Books. And it's still running. And it's pretty big now, which is cool. Um, I'm I'm proud that I was a part of it in the very beginning. And so she left after she graduated undergrad and had been in New Orleans. Um, So yeah, I went down there. And again, this entire story I'm recognizing makes me seem very impulsive. I didn't (laughs) have an apartment. (laughs) I would say passionate. I wasn't going to impulsive. (laughs) Risk taker. (laughs) There it is. Visionary. (laughs) Go with the flow. I don't know. (laughs) It's like, yeah, I'll come down there. I mean, I hadn't even been given a salary offer yet. I went down and I had no apartment. My mom drove with me and we um, printed out apartments at one of our hotels on the way. And we just like drove to them and called the person. And we were like, can you come show us this? And the first one I saw, I said, this is great. I'll take it. Can I move it today? I like this one. Let's go there. Yeah. I was like, this is fine. Can will electricity be on by the end of the day? And he was like, no, it's going to take three days. Oh my God. Wait, so what year? So I I know that Katrina happened in 2005. Yeah. So what year was this? Was this 2005? No, no, no. This was 20. When would that have been? 20, 2009, 2011. I don't know which year I graduated. It was after Katrina had happened, 
it was when they were finally trying to rebuild things. And so this was several years later. Right. When... For several years, it was still devastated or still impacted by what happened in 05. At least you're saying like four Completely. to six years later. Yeah. So five, six years later, when I went, um, it was completely still devastated. The school buildings hadn't been rebuilt. And so schools were suffering, I would say the most. Mm -hmm. And we had three schools that had to combine onto one campus in four modular buildings. Wow. So three schools had to share a cafeteria, a playground, and they were all in modulars, which if you know anything about New Orleans, there's hurricanes. So things would leak, um, you know, the library, the books were all damp. Like they were not supposed to be used for five, six, up to 10 years, but they were. Um, and so you had no facilities really. And by the time I had gotten there, there were still no counselors, school psychologists, any of that that had returned to the schools. Also a ton of political things like the city had definitely found ways to um, oust the teachers who were being paid well, who had been teachers in New Orleans for a really long time. And they brought in a whole bunch of people like me and Teach for America. And, um, you know, I'm very aware of that now, like, oh, there might've actually been a counselor there who was from New Orleans, but was being paid $80,000. And so they brought in people who wanted to help and had good intentions, but who they could pay half of that. So there's a lot in that, that yeah. I'm aware of. With that being said, I was there, we did a whole bunch of research on, um, what do you do in cities when there's a tragedy in the whole city to deal with mental health? Because obviously there's not going to be enough resources. Yeah. Um, and that was really interesting when I started to feel weird about the fact that I was being hired instead of a local, I left and that's why I left. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I also left for a guy, but both of those. Were <laughs> which I, I definitely want to hear more about both of those things, uh, you know, but to your point of like, sometimes we are well intended doing the best that we can. And yet sometimes we could be a part of some larger system process um, mm -hmm. that might be taking advantage of our good intentions and our heart and our effort. Uh, and, and, you know, also this thought of, you know, when you talk about New Orleans and what New Orleans went through and the, the increased mental health need, mm -hmm. it just made me think about COVID and all that we've experienced mm -hmm. and the increase in mental health need and how it's all, it's, it's not, it, it has been starting to become more need than even providers. And I, I guess it sounds like that's what you're saying happened in New Orleans. Yeah. There was more of need than folks who could actually be there and help and support. It's so similar. I haven't even thought about that, but there was more need. And then there were a lot of people who couldn't work for different reasons. Um, they had moved, they didn't want to anymore. It was too traumatizing. Um, and then there were people who did want to work, but they weren't going to be paid what they deserved to be paid. And that feels very familiar to right now where yeah. huge need, not enough people wanting to go back into the schools for many different reasons. And so not having enough access to, you know, what the kids need. So they should read our research paper about how to deal with <laughs> right, which, which sounds like it's timely. <laughs> yeah, it is very timely. So we created like a triage system Nice for triaging mental health. And what we would do is we would like universally assess every kid in the school got assessed for mental health concerns. Oh. And then they got categorized. And of course, this is not what you would do in an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. This is what you do in an emergency. So it was categorized like green, yellow, red. Red was if their assessment showed that there is like significant concern, yellow is it's getting there. And green was like, it, they definitely need support and they're not at huge risk right now. And we, what we would do is we would then find what would be appropriate in each of those levels. So green kids might really benefit. They might not 
there's not enough therapists, so they might not need a therapist, but maybe they could benefit from um, having a mentor. So we started like a mentorship program. Oh. Yellow, they need therapy, but there's not enough. So they could do group therapy. And then like red would get like the individual therapy, um, which was a way to kind of try to at least get kids in contact with things. And then we would track if they were moving from red to yellow to green, which was very cool. And they did the, the types of interventions they got access to did work um, and were helpful. I mean, that sounds fascinating. And yeah, I do think it's timely. Uh, and, you know, I think there's probably lots of other cities and locations where we miss the mental health need or for whatever reason or sets of reasons, we focus on other things. And there yeah. are lots of people who are struggling. And, and I'm wondering for you, as you're going through this, you're, you know, five, six years after Katrina, you graduate and drive down to New Orleans, you're there in the trenches, you're helping out, develop this uh, process and procedure. What do you think you were going through or feeling like, how did you handle that moment or those moments that uh, were surrounding all these things that you were doing? When I lived in New Orleans, I was not in a good place for multiple reasons. Um, but I loved my job. Like I was really happy whenever I went to work. Um, personally, I was struggling because I was in a really bad relationship, which was very back and forth and sad and just hard. And I was also struggling because New Orleans at the time was a tough place to live. You know, our uh, water would have to be boiled frequently because there would be, um, you know, the water systems would go down. And so there'd be germs and bacteria in the water. My car got flooded all the time. My car got oh. hit three times oh. by another car. So my car was totaled three times, twice while it was parked. Um, <laughs> like, it was I'm not hard. driving anymore. <laughs> so I, I actually stopped driving for a while because it was too, it was too like nerve wracking to yeah. drive. So I was having a tough time personally. And I was struggling with, I think, especially at my age with, um, being able to like transition into just living somewhere new with new friends and like, where's the grocery store and what's, it, it's a very different culture. Yeah. So new Orleans is an ama it's one of my favorite places and I want to move back um, now that I know more about it, but it's a very insular culture. So people have their friends from elementary school, high school, and they weren't happy with the outsiders, you know, and I, I a hundred percent get that. And I feel like a little more of an insider now. So I feel <laughs> like I could, I could get my way back in there. Um, so it was a little bit lonely, but professionally, I loved what I was doing and I love children. They're like my favorite thing in the oh. world. So being with kids all of the time, I also have such a soft spot for parents and a lot of the families had been through so much trauma. There's significant poverty in new Orleans. I mean, just significant, significant, not to be seen necessarily even in other cities. Um, and so I have such a soft spot for parents that I really loved treating parents who were struggling with like a lot of dignity. And I had very close relationships with the families that I worked with. Um, so that was really special. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. And I, I, I know because I've been there and I know yeah. other people have been there where you can be at a really great place personally, but mm -hmm. awful place professionally. Mm -hmm. Or the flip, <laughs> you could be in a bad place personally and a great place pro professionally mm -hmm. and, and how that can be uh, really tough. You know, the hope, <laughs> at least for me and <laughs> others, is that you're not at a bad place personally and professionally. That's where, like, hopefully you're getting some help and support uh, yeah. and that you can get to the place where you can really uh, be at a place, a good place personally and professionally, but that's not easy either. And, you know, that's, that has its own set of challenges, but it, it's just interesting to hear that professionally you were in a good place and you liked the work and you were empowering people. Uh, but personally it was, it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. And I went to, I remember I went to a therapist and I was crying and I was like, I feel like such an idiot that I'm having such a tough time. I have a beautiful apartment. I had really good friends. I mean, I, 
everything was actually fine in terms of like who I was surrounded by and all of that. But I'm so depressed. And she was like, of course you are. Your car has gotten totaled three times. Like you're not making enough money. You are in a new place and you feel kind of discombobulated from that. You see depressing things every single day that are really horrific. Like, of course you're depressed. And that was, that was validating and it helped a lot. I love that. I mean, so, and you and I, we can relate to this. And this is, this is my shout out to all the therapists out there, counselors, uh, marriage and family therapists, social workers, psychologists, however you come to help and support people. Uh, these are the moments that I think that we hope for and live for, where we validate the people that we are working with and we give them a picture of their world from our lens that just helps them to say, oh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't look at it that way or that just matters. And so I really appreciate you kind of sharing that. And it sounds like that was a shift for you in that moment. Oh, was, I mean, just her saying that I was like, oh, yeah, I, I, duh, <laughs> this is really <laughs> hard. <laughs> so you leave New Orleans uh, because you started to learn more about the system and didn't want to participate in that and a relationship. So how, what was the transition then for you? Uh, yeah, from so I left. I had no car because it was totaled. So I had to ship that back. <laughs> It was great. We found somebody who was local to take my spot in New Orleans, which felt good. And then I came back. The guy I found out was cheating with multiple people. So that didn't work out. And I, so I was really at rock bottom at that point because I was like, I left this job that I love and I was starting to create a community in New Orleans and not feeling that depressed anymore. And I came back to Philadelphia and this guy, it's not going to work out. And the job I took in Philadelphia was not great. Mm. Um, and I was like even broker than I was in New Orleans. So I was really not in a happy place. Um, and at some point, the job I had taken in Philly, their paychecks started bouncing. And so. Wait, 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 wait. The paychecks from the job was bouncing? Oh, mm -hmm. So that meant they yeah. weren't in a good place. So they, and it's a big organization. Oh, no. um, so their paychecks would bounce and like, it would take them a long time to get the new. So I would go weeks without getting paid because of that cycle to like get the bank to take yeah. it and deposit it. And I don't know about you, but w when I was like in my twenties, maybe even thirties, who knows, there were points if, if their check bounced, that means that affected my account even worse. Oh, I mean, I was bouncing checks. Like I yeah. wrote a check for my rent because I was supposed to have the check from work yeah. and that would bounce. And I would call Chase Bank and I would cry and I would say, I have like, can I, can you at least pause processing my rent check? Like the money will be in there tomorrow. And I mean, no, we can't do that. It's just going to have to bounce. And I, I, you know, what I just realized that so many of these banks, I mean, it makes sense to me, but some of these banks, the way that they also make a lot of money is through these fees that they yeah. charge folks who are sometimes, you know, in really bad situations. Yes, it's money management. Yes, it's being on top of it. But all the other part is that sometimes things like this happen that is not in your control. Yeah. And they didn't have a, a system where you could do deposits because they didn't have a location near me. So I had to do everything virtually. So there was a lot out of my control with that. And it would be like a $5 overdraft, but they would charge me $50. Yeah. Um, so I'll never go back to them as a bank because I remember, and they would probably want me now. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. See, you want me now, don't you? <laughs> this is my Academy Awards speech. Like Chase Bank, I'll never go back to <laughs> That's where you made your biggest mistake. <laughs> that is where, you know who I am. <laughs> It's my Hello. Julia Roberts moment. Um, so anyway, um, that's a personal opinion, and that is not by Leap yes. Cast. That is <laughs> no, I, I totally get it. So Whoa. I I was like really broke, like truly getting yelled at by my landlord, all sorts of stuff. Um, I have a vindictive streak, so I cancel. I did delete my. I canceled my bank account, so I didn't even have a bank yep. account anymore. Like canceled, they're done. There can't, I literally was like, fine, you're not getting my deposits anymore then. Thanks for not helping me. Um, and I quit the job. My dad was like, 
you need to quit. It's not okay to work there if they're bouncing your checks. And so I left, I didn't have a job again. Um, and I felt so, um, uncertain of what I was going to do because it seemed like anything else out there for therapists was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the same type of job with like not great pay, not great support, really difficult cases, which I actually adore, but you need to be getting paid for doing that type of hard work. Yeah. Um, and so I said, I was going to start a private, I applied to jobs, but then I was like, I think I'm just going to start a private practice. I did that. Um, it went well. I have been doing that since 2013 now. Wow. And so that's been fantastic. It's grown from having just me to having, I think, over 20 therapists now, which is 20? really cool. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And we're in Maryland and New York and um, Utah, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. So it's Utah? really cool. I mean, I, all the other ones seem like, I'm just curious, how did Utah pop up? Mm. So I had a couple who wanted to work with me. They came in for an intensive and when they went home, they said, we'd like to continue to work with you. There aren't really enough therapists in Utah. And so I was like, I should get some people licensed in Utah because it's such a huge state and it's yeah. hard to find people. Um, so that is, that's random, but I'm that's not. how it happened. <laughs> hey, look, that sounds like business expansion. <laughs> and then how you think about it, you see the need, you provide that need. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. So went from that to starting to share on Instagram thinking, you know, there's not everybody coming to therapy. What could we do to make it feel more mainstream and something people can get access to the information. Um, a few years after doing that, I was connected with an agent, Laura Lee, who, you know, and she, um, helped me with my book and I have a book now that's come out. So I think that is the, the long winding journey. There's the book. There's the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there, you, you shared a lot there, which is just awesome. And, I, I want to kind of come back to a few moments because we're going to definitely spend time talking about your practice, your Instagram um, influence, and of course your book. Um, when you talk uh, about like this move to decide to leave that job, <laughs> leave Chase and uh, move forward, uh, I'm just wondering like who helped you or supported you or who did you go to in that moment? I hear, I hear you talk about your dad. Uh, mm -hmm. and the therapist is back in New Orleans. Was there anyone else that you spoke to or helped you in those moments? You know, I was really embarrassed. So I actually don't think I told a lot of people what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think people knew I left and I, a lot of people left that job as well. So we were all kind of in the same boat because obviously others were experiencing this. Yeah. Um, my dad was super helpful. He is a business owner. Um, he's a lawyer, so he doesn't put up with S H I T and I'm a little bit more, much. I'm a little bit more passive and, and gentle around things like that. So he was the biggest support. He literally drove up the, the five. So the, the straw that broke the camel's back was they told me that they actually offered me too much money and that they were going to need me to pay back money mm. that they had paid me. And so he drove up that day. He was so mad. And he said, get in the car. We're driving. I felt like a high school student or something. He was like, we're driving up there and we, you're going to go in and you're going to get all of your stuff first because you don't want to quit and have them not let you back in. Yes. So go get all of your stuff. And then you're going to come out to the car and you're going to push send on this email I'm drafting. And he drafted the most legalese email that I would never send, but it was very much like, you're going to pay me my money and then interest, blah, 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 like, or else this is going to happen. And, you know, magically the money appeared in my bank account by midnight that day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm thinking about like, once again, the people who are there for us in these moments, right? Even though you say you felt like a high school, like I think that high schooler i think that sometimes in our lives we need sometimes someone or some group of people yes. who will just help kind of steer the ship because we might we might need it or we might not even recognize how uh how much we're in need and it sounds like your dad kind of knew 
uh, what to do, what to say, how to say it, and it, that produced some results, right? It was like the <laughs> the five things to do if you're going to quit. Well, get your stuff, right? <laughs> Draft an email, do all these things to move forward. And it sounds like in that moment, you probably needed uh, someone like that. And if not, like that, that probably would have kept you in a, a space that would have been maybe not so good for you. Absolutely. And I think when people are in <clears throat> a dark hole, when they feel completely overwhelmed, like broken down, just like powerless, you off, you do need that strong arm person. Sometimes I've done that with my own friends where I'm like, all right, enough is enough. Get in the car. We're, it's go. over. <laughs> We're doing this thing that you need to do because I know you can't do it right now. And I would say that that moment was the best thing that somebody could have ever done for me, even though it might go against like, um, common advice of like, don't overreach, don't right. da, 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 da. like I needed my dad to overreach. And he drove me back to my childhood home. Hmm. It was like, you're staying here the weekend and you're going to figure out what the heck you're doing to get your life together. And that's just, what's going to happen. And so that moment, like he, it wasn't like he was a support every single day. Like he didn't right. really help me with anything with building the business or anything like that. But just knowing that he was on my side mm -hmm. and I think people need that. They need somebody who's like, oh, I see it the way you see it too. I'm on your side. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. And I support you in making this change that you need to make for your life. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting how, you know, embarrassment and shame. And I know Brene Brown does a lot on this can like just kind of take our voice <laughs> and mm -hmm. we don't say or do much. Uh, and we're stuck and sometimes we need somebody to overreach because they see us they see that we're just not in a good space and shout out to your dad for doing that and being willing to take that risk and it sounds like that allowed you to just have some thoughts about okay i want to move forward so you you've built and for all those who are, who are listening it's not a small practice it's an amazing well-run practice that helps people in so many different ways. Uh, I'm, I'm just excited about the work that you've been able to do, not only as a therapist, but as a business owner, as a coach, as a someone who impacts people's lives on so many levels. And I guess how has your business evolved from, I guess, 2013 to now? Like, what are some of the things that you've thought about or did or changed uh, along the way? When I opened it and decided I wanted to take people on, my biggest um, goal was that I was going to be very different from anywhere I had worked and that I really wanted to make sure that people weren't miserable, that they felt respected, all sorts of things. So when I first brought people on, there would be weeks that I made sure that they were being paid more than I was. Like if I couldn't make payroll, like they got the money first and I wouldn't pay myself at all. Wow. Um, and I think that leading with that, and that's not how it is now. And if mm -hmm. you run a business like that forever, it's not sustainable. <laughs> it's not and you, shouldn't, right. you should right. definitely be able to enjoy the fruits of your labor. But at the center was always that I want people to feel happy working here, especially as therapists, if they have a chip on their shoulder about work, their clients aren't going to be taken care of as well. It just makes sense, right? Like yeah. if we're disgruntled, it comes out like in one way or another. And so totally. you take care of the people who are taking care of, of others. Yeah. So that's that's been how I've tried to always evolve it. And anytime that there's room to do it, I add more in to support them. And so since then, it's gone from being like just a fee split practice to being a place where people are W-2 employees they get benefits. Um, and then there's like positions that they can move into. So people can move into like a clinical director, like salaried position. I've had people open their own offices, um, as like satellite offices. So I've been able to like coach them in their own leadership and it's, it's grown, but it's always growing with wanting to help the therapist grow in mind. So that's like always what I'm thinking about first. And I'm wondering, did your experiences in community college and in uh, undergrad, did that now start to help like you in this business and how you thought about it? Obviously your clinical experience helped you and your work experience, but I'm wondering if some of those other things that you did, did you start to see them come back in, in this business for you? 
everything that I did has helped me maybe even more than just my clinical training, honestly, like all of that wild path that I went on those moments of like very quick decisiveness, passionate, visionary experience. I'm really glad that I, you know, said, I want to learn about negotiations. That seems important. I'm going to do it. That, that has helped me so much to be able to negotiate contracts, to be able to understand how people think and to, to create win-win solutions, like taking ASL classes, which is American sign language. So important. It helped to open my world to how there are so many different cultures and people that don't have access to things, yeah. even though they should. And how do we make sure that people have access, you know, where you can provide it, um, taking the organizational development classes. I now understand what types of things do you let your people make decisions on versus what don't you allow them to make decisions on? So every single thing I did was of value. To me, that just adds on to this part where we talk about trust in yourself, right? Like, I know that sometimes we can feel lost or that we don't know what we're doing or that it, the person who's older or wealthier knows better. But oftentimes the truth is like within us and mm -hmm. it doesn't always come out sometimes until <laughs> a few years down the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you trusted yourself and you gave yourself permission to just try these things and how every single decision, right, give or take, has really come back to help you in this thriving business that you've developed, which I just think is really awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wild how it's it's turned into this result. And if anybody's listening, that's in the messier part, like keep going, <laughs> things do become, things do start to make sense at some point. <laughs> Good. Good. So, Another big thing that I know that you have been able to do and to develop, I mean, you you said it quickly and obviously because we were just uh, kind of given a recap, is your your presence on Instagram. It is mm. not small. Uh, <laughs> you are, as they call, an influencer. And with all that you've been through, like, how did that start? And was there a point where it just kind of skyrocketed for you? Or was it just a build from the very begin, beginning? Yeah, so I started it in, I think, 2018. And I think that I started it during a time where, like, I was lucky to have started it then because there wasn't really a lot of other people doing it yet. And so I just started sharing information, like things that would come up in sessions and people were really interested in it. And so I was lucky they would share it on their own stories and all of that. And it did grow fairly quickly. I would say, you know, the first year, maybe it got to like 20,000. And then from there, it's continued to grow. I think that consistency has been a huge part. I notice that when I get tired of it and I kind of give up for like a couple of weeks that that limits the growth and the connection. But when I'm consistent, it seems to have just like a steady growth. No, and I really like and appreciate that you have been impacting people on their mental health and their well-being through social media, in particular through Instagram. Part of my career has ha has been the belief that everyone is not going to come to therapy or in the therapy room, but but could benefit from therapeutic information or advice or just ways of of thinking and. And so that's really pushed me from the podcast that we're doing now to media appearances. And I love how you have created a space that people can come to your page or or see it through somebody else's uh, a page when they when it gets shared and and learn and grow. And and I'm wondering, like, what has that all the, those moments been like for you to know that what you are sharing has been a, a impactful for people? Yeah. Well, first of all, that's what I love about you is that you do such a good job of making sure that you're sharing it in so many different places, whether it's like media appearances for adults or like kids with Nickelodeon. I mean, there's just so many ways that you do that. Thank you. I think that it's so cool when I get DMs from people. I got this DM the other day and it was really long 
And it said something like, I've never messaged you, but my husband and I have been following you for years. And we like always will joke with each other and say, I don't think Liz would say that. (laughs) So for anybody listening, I share relationship tips, but um, um, Liz listens. I get it right this time. Um, Liz listens or listen, Liz. I'm sure it would show up either way. <laughs> it probably would. But I, I got this long message from her about how they've like used it over the years and they have like an inside joke about me and that she's cheering me on. And it was just so touching. And oh. I get these types of messages all the time that just remind me that people really do want access to it. I get a lot of messages from people that have no access. You know, they live in a part of the country where there's not therapists really, um, or they just don't have the financial means to see a therapist. And so they'll write me and say, you know, I've always wanted to go to therapy, but I can't, but this is really helpful to me. Um, I have people say, I grew up in really dysfunctional home. Like there was a lot of abuse and this is helping me to figure out how I want my relationships to look. So it's so meaningful. There's something about, like you said, being consistent, uh, sharing those things that are within you uh, in a healthy, helpful way. And we never know. We never know who is listening, who's watching, who's Mm -hmm. reading and, Mm -hmm. and how it can really be of impact. So, you know, we like to end with a a few different questions, which I think could lead to at least one of the things I know that you're doing. Uh, And so one of those questions is, what are you doing now? And I know one of those things is the book. So tell me more about it, which I was so excited when I got my copy that I pre-ordered. I want this. You're a true friend, (laughs) a true friend (laughs) pre-ordering. So so tell, tell us, what are you up to? And maybe share some about the book, please. Yeah. So, um, my book just came out on November 30th. It's called, I want this to work. And it's really a comprehensive guide to just relationships. I wanted to have a book where there was information that you might find in like 80 books in one spot. And that was at a level where you could do something with it. You know, I think when I'm working with couples, they don't need to read the whole book attached. They just need to understand like, what are some small ways this might be playing out for us. And so I created something where it's all of the stuff that I want you to know. If you were coming to see me as a couples therapist, I would want you to know about these things so that we could have really good conversations. Um, And it provides journaling prompts and like talk about it prompts. So at the end of each chapter, you can sit down together and you can ask each other the questions that I suggest. And then at the end, it even has scripts. So if you don't know what to say, you can use the script. I love that. So many times I feel like that's what I do. Like I, I say something and so then a client will tell me, can you say that again? Because they, they want to yeah. write it down. Right. So they have the script, the prompts. And and like you said, you're right. There are parts of books or articles or things that we share in therapy. And to just come to one central place, this book uh, to get that is, is really great. And And I'm wondering for you, like, I could just see the arc, right? Like you have been passionate about helping people, families, children, relationships, and you've done it in so many ways. And then you, you've done it in this really public way through social media and uh, in particular Instagram. And now you get to do this in this national and international way through this book, because I know it's international. Uh, international relations, look, it comes back. Look at that. <laughs> All part of the plan. Educating internationally. Wow. I knew that I was right <laughs> freshman year. <laughs> Where's your sister? We're gonna we're gonna bring her on. We're gonna tell her <laughs> who's yeah. the loser now. <laughs> no, but I, I love that, right? Yeah. Like this thing that you wanted internationally from the very beginning, and your book is international. And I guess what has some of those moments been knowing that it's been translated right already in a few languages? Yeah, right now it's going through the translation process for Russian, Chinese, Slavian, and oh my gosh, I can't remember the other language that they've started on, but they've started on like four or five languages right now, which That's is cool. Amazing. Right. And talk about, you know, when you talk about cultures and people who might not have access to me, that's what that means, right? To be translated in another language means someone could have access to this and find their central hub of of how to do the work uh, for their relationship. And so what have those moments meant for you? 
It's amazing. I mean, sometimes it, it feels, this has been such a long process that to be honest, it's like, okay, awesome. Like what's right. next? Right. <laughs> I get that. But there are moments where I'll get like a DM from somebody today. Somebody messaged me with a picture of their book in India. I was just like, oh my gosh. And like going back to when I was little, I've been obsessed always with knowing people around the world. I started a pen pal club when I was in fifth grade nice. where people could send me a dollar and I would connect them with a random person. <laughs> you were a visionary from the early. So like, this is awesome. So like, this is very much like my fifth grade heart being like, I get to be friends with people in India. Like that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we like to end with, you know, a few last questions. Um, and I appreciate just you sharing and, and your journey. Um, one, is there anyone that you would love to work with or collaborate with? Uh, when you just think about anybody, who would that be? The Obamas. <laughs> Look, they're on the list. <laughs> the okay, Obamas. so I have two people, two couples. Okay, go ahead. Um, so right now I'm like uh, running, working with um, some co-founders to create a premarital counseling app. And I would love to work with the Obamas and I would love to work with Dak Shepard and Kristen Bell. Yes. I think that both of those couples are just very cute and also real. Like, I feel like they have problems sometimes probably, and they argue with each other, but they get over it. And I like couples who seem real. No, I love that. It, especially around couples who have a strong bond that they want to, they want this to work, right? They want their relationship to work. And even with the kind of things that come up, they find their way back to center, which is really great. Yeah. What What would you say, or how would you define mental wellness? Hmm, that's a good question. So it all comes back to relationships for me. <laughs> and I feel like people can have mental wellness when they feel supported mm. by others. And when they know who their system is that they can tap into. And so you might be struggling with a mental illness. You might be struggling with a life transition, any of those things. But when you feel supported the way I was by my dad, <laughs> um, when you feel supported by your community or your system or your family or your friends, it's not easy, but it's much easier to be able to get to a place that feels good. And I think that when people are in a place of mental wellness, they feel like they can let people in, they can connect with people and also that they can help others as well. And so for me, it comes back to relationships. That, that makes sense and I love it. And, and, you know, I fully believe, right? The people we are connected to when there are struggles or issues or concerns there, it impacts us and it impacts our mental wellness. Totally. Yeah. Uh, my last big question for you is what mental wellness advice would you give to your younger self? And that could be as young as yesterday or any time in the past. I think that I would suggest to my younger self to not be so worried about romantic relationships. Hmm. When I think back, I actually was never truly too stressed out about all of my risk-taking decisions. I, I do. I like that you said, I trust myself. I am fairly decisive. And I think at the end of the day, I trust myself and I would become very depressed, very, um, like thought obsessive about relationships and my heart would get broken very easily. And it would upset me, even though I would have everything else going right, it could completely deflate me. Yeah. And so I think I would want to teach myself to have better boundaries. I think I would want to teach myself to know how to have emotional regulation around that type of thing. Like, yes, you're sad, but take some deep breaths and go for a walk. You don't need to cry in bed for an hour. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, yeah, I wish I could be my my 22 year old's counselor. And I could say, I get it. This is very upsetting, but let's learn emotional regulation and let's mm -hmm. set some boundaries with these guys. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And, and right. <laughs> so many times in those times of our life and relationships, and it's not just in, you know, early twenties for some people this you know, forties, fifties, sixties, uh, oh. that those experiences might happen. 
but to find some skills to regulate your emotions, like you said, have some boundaries, and realize that there there's goodness uh, in you, and that you know you move forward and it can work out. Liz, I, I love uh, the conversation and the time with you. I love all that you have gone through, even when it didn't feel so smooth or maybe felt messy. You trust in yourself. People who have been there from your uh, therapist to friends to your dad to those who you've been connected with along the way and how everything has come together to impact people, right? Like the, from the vision of being international relations and how you've done that. <laughs> and I love it. Uh, and so, you know, for those out there, go get the book. Once again, I want this to work. Uh, also, uh, check out and support Liz Listens. And, uh, you know, Liz, I really appreciate you being a part. And I don't know if there's anything else that you want to say. Please let us know if there's anything else on your mind before we end. No, thank you so much for having me on. I feel like I've said a lot. <laughs> You shared uh, a tremendous uh, amount that I think is just really valuable and really has been impactful for me and, and my thoughts about the impact that I'm trying to make. And I just love seeing what you're doing. And I'm happy for you. I'm excited for you. And for everyone out there, once again, uh, go out and support. This has been Leapcast, where we talk to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And we have been having a conversation with uh, Liz Earnshaw and her amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible ride we just went on with another great member of the Leapcast community. I appreciate you listening and hope you got some tangible value from the episode. Please let us know what you think by leaving a comment, rating, and review. As always, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Dr. George James, and I'll see you next time.